Hi, everyone. Welcome to SF Zine Fest 2021 Cyberfest Rebooted. Today, we have two special guests who will be having a conversation with us <laughs> and actually each other. It's No Straight Lines and Archiving Queer Comics History with Justin Hall and Margaret Galvin. These are the order of events uh, that are going to happen. I will do an intro for San Francisco Zine Fest. Then we'll go over some house rules and expectations we have. Um, I'll introduce myself and the artists. And then Justin and Margaret will just do their magic. And then we'll close it out in the last five minutes. San Francisco Zine Fest was founded in 2001 as a gathering place for writers and artists from around the world, but especially the Bay Area. It's typically held as a one day event at the County Fair building in Golden Gate Park. Our 2019 festival had about 240 exhibitors and over 5,000 attendees. Due to COVID-19, our 2020 festival spanned three weeks and encompassed over 21 days of zine related activities and was 100% online. This year's festival, Cyberfest Rebooted, is a nine day festival that's mostly virtual with some in-person workshops and collaboration with local Bay Area bookstores. This is our safer spaces policy uh, that when we're in person um, and also virtual, we expect folks to agree to. We are committed to providing a harassment free experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, their disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. We will not tolerate harassment at San Francisco Zine Fest events in any form. Individuals violating the safer spaces policy may be sanctioned or expelled from the space or the event at the discretion of any SF Zine Fest organizer. Basically, respect people's opinions their beliefs, their differing states of being, and their differing points of view. Always get explicit verbal consent before taking someone's photo or crossing other personal boundaries. Be responsible for your actions and be aware that they may have an effect on others regardless of your original intent. A safe and respectful community is everyone's responsibility. So what is Cyberfest Rebooted? Well, well, this year, as I explained, we're going from August 28th through September 5th. We will have virtual shows, uh, show and tell, readings, some in-person workshops, uh, and of course, panels such as this one. We're also, for the first time, uh, collaborating with local um, like comic book stores, uh, all sorts of stores <laughs> in the Bay Area, and they'll be selling exhibitors uh, zines at their stores. Our guest of honor for this year is Tiny Splendor, and they've invited three guests also, and they are Ocean Escalante, Samantha Espinoza, and Tamiko Sidora. The festival poster was designed by Sana Khan of Tiny Splendor. This is me. <laughs> I'm the guy who's been talking very slowly just now. Um, I am a queer South Asian artist. My name is Anand Bedawala. I'm a writer and also an educator based in Oakland. I currently teach uh, kindergarten in San Francisco and I'm one of the organizers of San Francisco Zine Fest. My first self-published book, A Hundred Years From Now, Our Bones Will Be Different, with artist Lawrence McWilliams, received a starred review from Publishers Weekly. 
And in 2018, uh, my zine Hair was awarded Best Zine and Best Per Zine by Broken Pencil Zine Awards. I'm currently stressed and immensely grateful for San Francisco Zine Fest volunteers. You can learn more about me on my website at anandberawala.com. Guidelines for Zoom. Uh, please keep your video off unless you are presenting. This will prevent lagging. Remember to keep yourself on mute unless you are presenting. For presenters, if you have a question, ask in the chat. There are chat moderators in there. Chat will be available only for panelists. Attendees or viewers who are watching um, the webinar also, uh, they may ask questions using the Q&A feature. Compliment each other in the chat or just say hi if you'd like. ASL interpretation is provided by local interpreters, Nicole Watson and Norma Sanchez. <clears throat> Be mindful for folks who are blind or visually impaired by being specific and descriptive when sharing your work. This webinar is being recorded and broadcast to Facebook and YouTube as well. Above all, please be respectful. Also ask questions. As we mentioned before, if you're watching in the Zoom webinar, please use the Q&A feature to ask any questions you may have. If you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, ask questions in the live chat. Kind of description here of the panel we have today. Um, no Straight Lines was the first museum show of LGBTQ comics art, then a Lambda winning book, and now a documentary film that recently premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. Join the curator, editor, producer, I guess he's doing everything, um, Justin Hall, as he chats about archiving queer comics and paying homage to its pioneers, with Maggie Galvin, who goes by Margaret Galvin, University of Florida professor and Stanford fellow is researching queer comics and zines. This is Justin. Justin Hall is the creator of To Travel. I need to move this, this Zoom is blocking everything. Okay. True Travel Tales, Hard to Swallow, and Theater of Terror, Revenge of the Queers with work in the Best American Comics and Best Erotic Comics. He's the chair of the MFA in Comics program at California College of the Arts, the first Fulbright Scholar of Comics and a producer of No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics, which was inspired by his book, which was inspired by his Lambda winning and Eisner nominated book. You can learn more about Justin on Justin Paul awesomecomics.com, Justin Comics on Twitter, Justin Hall Comics on Instagram, Justin Hall.comics on Facebook. Margaret Galvin is assistant professor of, of, of visual rhetoric at the University of Florida. Her archivally informed research examines how visual culture culture operates within feminist and queer social movements of the 1970s through 90s, and includes a forthcoming book, Invisible Archives. This year, she's in residence at the Stanford Humanities Center as a distinguished junior external fellow, is researching her own, her second book about how American LGBTQ cartoonists in the 1980s through 90s formed community through comics. You can learn more about her at margaretgalvin.org, at Magdor on Twitter, and Caddy Cleo on Instagram. Whew, I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> I'm going to pass it off to Justin Hall and, Mag and Margaret Galvin. OK, so should I? I will share my screen. Hello, everybody. Hey, everyone. I'm just going to um, enter into the 
the presenter view, but if we need to repin our anyone here, just want to make sure that gets done. Um, so yeah, I think Justin and I, we just want to have a conversation today um, about, uh, you know, I was looking um, at everything. I realized it's been a decade and a half that you've been working on this project, probably longer, because um, 2006 was when um, you had that first museum show at the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco, um, which sort of started this project of No Straight Lines. This is the cover we're seeing right now of the book. I have it with me here. It's a great book. I always, I have like my teaching notes in it from when I teach it in class um, right here. Um, it's something I often draw upon. Um, so I want to hear sort of, uh, you know, what got you started with this project in 2006? Um, what was its scope? How many cartoonists um, were involved? All of that. <laughs> yeah, so um, actually, uh, let's um, uh, stop screen sharing so we can um, go back to and just see our face for a moment. Okay. Um, the, um, yeah, so 2006, well, I'm trying to, uh, it was interesting uh, trying to recollect uh, <laughs> all of this with my um, my memory cells, which have taken a quite a beating over the years. Um, I, uh, I started um, uh, joining the comics community in around 2001. I came out with my first comic and I went to the um, Alternative Press Expo, which was a major, one of the major independent um, comic conventions that was held here in San Francisco. And um, uh, I, uh, I started tabling there. And then uh, in 2003, Alison Bechdel was their um, guest of honor. And I, so I, I knew her work from, from Dykes to Watch Out For, and I figured, okay, I'll try to put together a panel of queer cartoonists, just sort of gathering the other uh, LGBTQ cartoonists that were in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in the convention. And um, that started, a, I, I did this then for 12 years um, uh, until, the, until uh, Ape left San Francisco. I did this queer cartoonist panel. Um, and that first panel, when I had um, Allison on, uh, made me realize that there was, I didn't know that there was this entire other world of queer comics that was distinct from the, the rest of the comics industry and the comics world, even the independent comics. Um, but, you know, Allison made it clear when she, she came up, uh, when we were talking, she said, I, that she, she let me know that um, even though she'd been making Dykes to Watch Out For, for 20 years at that point, she had never been to a comics convention. Here's this woman who is undeniably one of the greatest cartoonists on the planet, even at that point, but this is before Fun Home. But she was, you know, Dykes to Watch Out For was this monumental work. And um, she had never been to a comics convention. So that sort of blew my mind and started me off on a, um, a sort of journey of uh, both trying to discover what had happened before in the queer comics world, you know, that sort of parallel universe. And then um, also trying to figure out a way to bring you know, uh, uh, both the work of that earlier, of those earlier generations in, and also uh, you know, younger cartoonists, newer generations that were coming up into the mainstream of the comics industry. And um, so I think of myself as sort of a liminal figure and the sort of liminal space between um, the cartoonists, the queer cartoonists that came before that really existed only within this you know, queer cartooning underground and the stuff, the stuff that happens now, which is where queer cartoonists have access, that queer cartooning underground has sort of fallen apart. Um, uh, and what, we can talk about that later, but, um, but, you know, now these younger queer cartoonists are able to really access stuff that was impossible before. They're able to, you know, go to conventions and have tables and uh, produce, you know, openly queer work that is published by major publishers, but both within the comic book industry and within the book publishing industry, and even get awards for that work. Um, and that none of that was possible when I started. Um, so I'm sort of in that in between stage. Um, and when I realized all of this was so, there was this 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 uh, wealth of material that had come before, and it was in danger of being lost. Right, because the queer and feminist bookstores were were vanishing, the queer distributors and publishers, underground lesbian presses were were vanishing, and all and all of this work was in danger of being lost. And so um, I pitched to the Cartoon Art Museum uh, in 2006. I pitched to them curating a show of queer comics art. I just done a solo show with their um, 
uh, small press spotlight for my travel comics. And they, so they, they still took a big risk on me. <laughs> it wasn't really that well known, um, but uh, they jumped at it and we created No Straight Lines, which was the first mu- world's first museum show of, of queer comics art. And that sort of started off the process. I think that was a rambling answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. There's a lot of threads in there. Um, that's re- really interesting. Um, thinking about, I know there had been, um, uh, like shows at like queer, like LGBTQ centers before of comics are in the nineties and at bookstores, but all these places that you're saying that are in danger of, you know, being um, lost and being um, uh, forgotten or, or, or just being sort of like less visible. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's exciting to hear. I didn't get to go to the show in 2006, but it's exciting to sort of hear you sort of talk about um, how uh, it came to be. Um, because I'm sort of more familiar with the book, right? Um, and uh, interested to hear also, like, how did it, was it just naturally now I want to do a book um, with this anthology? Now I have all the stuff or, you know, it was sort of six, seven years later, the book comes out. So what's the process in between the museum show and then the eventual book, which is, you know, not just as early material, right? No Straight Lines is four decades of queer comics, Um it's 300 plus pages. It's really hard. Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine uh, how you put together um, like all of these comics, right? Cause it's such an amazing scope um, of comics. And even you had to say, I think in the introduction, like I didn't include any of the erotic work because that's actually very well documented elsewhere. Um, but I, I wanted to include sort of a wide range of what constitutes queer comics and not stuff in the mainstream either, right? Um, so much, but sort of this uh, independent and more so grassroots world that as you just put it was in danger of being lost. So can you talk about that sort of process with the book? Yeah, the, um, uh, the, I, we had actually talked about making a catalog for the show um, and the show was of you know, a, a much smaller scope in terms of numbers of creators. You, you can't put as many creators in, in, a, in a museum show as you can in a, in a book. So, um, but we wanted to do a catalog of the book and sort of expand it, expand it out of it from, from the actual offerings in the, um, on the museum walls. And, uh, but the funding fell through for that catalog. So it was sort of in the back of my head as something to do to create a book out of this, um, out of this material. Um, but it, it, then it sort of languished for a while. I, I was doing other projects um, and then sort of came back to it and um, uh, pitched it to Fanographics and they, they, kind of, they jumped at it, which was wonderful. And then I realized, at, so at that point I had been involved with um, Prism Comics, which is uh, a nonprofit supporting LGBTQ comics and creators and fans uh, with a has a really large presence at San Diego, San Diego Comic Con, and we do also a, <clears throat> um, a small press grant as well for queer uh, creators. So um, I've been involved with them. I was um, part of sort of growing that. Uh, out at Comic Con. So again, sort of thinking about what the comics world was like when I when I entered it, it was very, it was so straight and so cisgender. Like I mean, we, uh, it felt sort of. I, I had this very out life in San Francisco when I would go to Comic Con, and I felt like I was like going back into the closet. It was very, it, very subversive and you know, kind of weird to be to be queer then, um, <laughs> and. Um, uh, the, the in 2003, uh, Prism Comics formed. Uh, th- there were people that were doing. I want to make clear that there were people doing work, queer work in the mainstream uh, uh, comics industry before this. So Andy Mangles uh, has a, a famous um, uh, panel that he's been running for many, many years. I think since the ni- the mid 1990s, um, uh, um, called uh, Gays in Comics and Out in Comics. Uh, Phil Jimenez uh, came out as a prominent gay creator. Uh, Rachel Pollock uh, was an out trans creator created the first trans superhero back in 1993. So there were there was stuff that I don't mean to say that um, queer material wasn't showing up in other places, but but it was very much marginalized. Um, and for the most part, if you were doing uh, a mainstream comic book, um, uh, most of the mainstream uh, really kind of stayed away from any queer uh, content or material or characters. And um, uh, really the only people tackling these sort of issues were um, were queer creators in this in this underground, 
and they hadn't been invited into uh, places like Comic-Con before. But now with PRISM, they, we were given a booth and we ex eventually expanded that out to three booths. Uh, it was a place that queer creators could come and rent space and then uh, sell their work at, at the convention, uh, which is prohibitively expensive if you need to get, oftentimes, if you need to get a full booth to yourself, it can be uh, really expensive for, for especially marginalized creators. Um, and so uh, this allowed other people coming into the, to the con, it, it created sort of a nexus, a queer nexus, a space for people to gather. Um, and, and then we also started sponsoring panels at, at Comic-Con. And that was my job was to do a lot of the panel work and, um, and also just sort of meet everybody. So at this point I sort of had, you know, met enough people and, and knew that I could expand upon the work that I'd done with the museum show um, and come back to this sort of historical project and create a book. So, um, uh, you know, I had to do more research um, as well, you know, digging through archives and, uh, and you know, asking a lot of questions. Um, but at that point, I, I sort of knew a lot of the, the, the players within the queer comics world, which was much smaller than it is now. Um, it was easier just sort of to know everybody. Um, and that's how the, the book got started. Uh, it, and it was, um, you know, even then I knew I needed to scale back its scope. It couldn't be sort of universal, right? I, it, there's just too much material. So the, oddly enough, the, um, the erotic material, uh, especially for gay men, has been better archived because of groups like the Tom of Finland Foundation and the Center of Sex and Culture. And um, so that stuff was less in danger of being lost. Uh, but I was most worried about the sort of literary queer comics that were uh, the purview of the queer and feminist bookstores and these queer publishers that were going under. Um, uh, I also, uh, I also uh, kept it the, to Western comics. So it's mostly North American comics, a few European comics, um, the world of manga in particular, or uh, a lot of different Asian comics uh, have a lot of queer material, uh, not just manga, but manga is the, obviously the biggest um, uh, industry in, in the world. And there's a lot of queer content there, but it really requires another specialist and I'm not that specialist and it has an entirely different cultural context and um, a context of different sorts of identities and uh, a different history. So I knew that needed to be done by someone else. So that was the limitations, uh, not the erotic material uh, and really keeping within Western comics. Um, great. I mean, I think you still covered a lot of ground um, even given that. I want to hear perhaps a little bit more about your research uh, process. You've said, you know, digging in archives, but I'm sure, or maybe, maybe it's just me because I like to dig in archives too, but um, where were you looking? Were you, um, were you find, where were you finding these comics? Were you um, going into people's personal uh, collections, like other cartoonists? I know that since uh, cartoonists and queer cartoonists are super marginalized, sometimes they're often the bearers of their own history, right? Um, so I know, you know, Alison Bechtel's papers, which are archived at Smith, not only contain her own work, but the like sort of the history of queer of, of a lot of other queer cartoonists, right? Um, in, in terms of what she's um, you know kept, um, I know this is the case for a lot of um, cartoonists. So where were you looking? Were you going on to like eBay online to find uh, materials? Uh, you know, what collections were you tra traveling the country? Were you staying in San Francisco, which I know has a lot of archives? Like, what was this process like? I just want to know more. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed talking to you because you're, you're actually a serious academic who does research probably in much more sophisticated ways than I, than I do. Most, mo honestly, most of, most of it for me was simply knowing people and calling them up and being like, what can you tell me? Um, and then sometimes visiting people, I, I saw Andy Nangle's amazing collection of work um, uh, in Portland and, um, uh, you know, talked to Jennifer Camper and Robert Kirby, who were sort of on the ground floor of a lot of the stuff, um, and Howard Cruz. Um, uh, and then I dug through the, the uh, Last Gasp, which was the publisher for a lot of this material. Um, they're an underground comics um, publisher and distributor in San Francisco. And they have this amazing warehouse that's a sort of labyrinthian, you know, like collection of stacks and stacks of, of uh, bookshelves. And, and there are like cobwebs and like, you know, weird piles of old 
uh, you know, in underground comics, you know, in the, in the corners and zines. And, and I would just start digging through all this stuff and finding these little gems and like remarkable um, uh, manuscripts. Um, also uh, people like Trina Robbins, who's done a lot of work around you know, women cartoonists and was such a pivotal, pivotal part of, of the emerging uh, queer comics um, scene. So, uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to just have have these people, you know, as part of my my contacts, right? Uh, people that I could reach out to and and get help with. Um, and um, at that point, I'd just been doing my own collecting as well. And um, uh, so a lot a lot of it's quite was quite ad hoc. But um, I, I dug I dug around where I could and just followed up as many leads as possible. I mean, I think you have to be ad hoc with a project like this um, because a lot of it isn't archived or. If it's in the archives, it's hidden and you have to know where to look for it. Like I mentioned that um, Alison Bechdel has her papers archived, but that was uh, only recently, I think, sort of as you're finishing up the book project and a lot of folks still have their own materials with them. Uh, yeah, Howard, Howard Cruz now has been picked up, his, his papers were picked up by the um, Columbia um, yeah. through, through Karen Green, who's been such a, a great advocate. But yeah, I mean, you know, comics, you know, are, are not archived well as, as um, as a, a form, and then you know, queer material even less so, right? So, and it's one of the, uh, you know, one of my personal goals here is because you know, queer comics history in particular, it's sort of marginalized upon marginalized, um, and in in just so in danger of of being erased. Um, so um, that was a, a huge sort of you know, the, my passion behind doing these projects. Um, I, I wanted to try to stop that as as much as I could, um, uh, but. It's you know it's interesting kind of thinking about archiving comics now and one of the things I've I've thought about tackling you know if you know I have a lot of projects going on but but to to really create a a, a good archive of queer comics material now that now that different archives and museums are actually interested and universities and such are actually interested in this material. Um, I helped uh, co-curated co a show of queer comics art that was much more international at the Schwulers Museum in Berlin. Um, and that was an amazing experience. Um, that was, um, um, and that made me, you know, made me realize more the sort of the broader scope of this material. And also the fact that, that these museums are now interested in, uh, this material and, and collecting it and archiving it. So I think I think there is there is definitely um, more and more opportunities for queer cartoonists to to get their work um, safely, um, uh, you know, archived and, and kept for future generations. Yeah, I mean, at Columbia, you mentioned Karen Green's work there as curator is fantastic. I know Ohio State. Uh, which is a long time comics uh, collection has uh, been collecting some really exciting um, papers, especially by women recently. Um, so, you know, there is sort of some of the stuff is uh, starting to migrate um, into these spaces. Um, but I'm sure sometimes people, especially if you've been marginalized for so long, you sort of want to keep on, like keep, keep, keep your stuff, uh, right? It's yeah. your, it's, Cause the stuff is the community, right? Like that's the thing is the, um, Sometimes these cartoonists were uh, in the same place as each, as each other, but unlike, uh, we talk about the, uh, the comics underground, and a lot of it's like the people lived and worked in San Francisco, although that's not exclusively true, queer comics and cartoonists were often scattered around the country and internationally, and they would meet on the pages of these publications that you're then sort of reprinting in No Straight Lines. Um, it's, it, there's even examples of these sort of comic jams, right? Like Jennifer Camper had and, and Juicy Mother, where she would, where they would literally mail, you know, these pages back and forth between various creators like Diane Damasa and Ivan Bellas Jr. Um, and each one, each person would do their own panel and then mail it to the next person, um, which is funny to think about given, you know, today's how easy that would be today with, with digital technology. But, but it was a way of forming community around, you know, different areas of the country. Um, though a lot of it was happening actually in San Francisco because the publishers were here um, that were dealing, dealing with this work. So um, uh, th there was, you know, both happening. Um, and, and you're talking before about kind of keeping our own history. We, we do a lot of trades, right? So, you know, zines, I mean, this is still true, hard, you know, hard baked into zine culture, but, you know, we trade all the time. And certainly queer cartoonists, I have so many queer zines and, um, and many comics and, you know, sort of self-published comics that I've traded with other creators over the years. And it, and it really is a sort of an, uh, a, an archive ultimately. Um, and even um, original art, I was able to, I've, 
traded art with Allison and Bechdel and other people. Um, uh, and that's that's really special because then we have you know original work. I have like a John Macy, original John Macy hanging on my wall. And I mean, it's that's that's beautiful. That's a, that's a yeah, it makes you feel good as part of a community. Yeah, and I mean, that's, I think, you know, everyone's, uh, all these cartoonists, all your papers sort of are evidence of, of the community. I know um, I felt really lucky a number of years ago at this point when Jennifer Camper invited me to come and look at her papers. Um, and really looking at her, her papers are not just looking at her original art, but or her, her own work, but this whole community, right? Yeah. And learning about um, some of these earlier community efforts, like in the early 90s, uh, cartoonist Andrea and Natalie started the Lesbian Cartoonist Network, which was yep. a newsletter um, that she started publishing, but then others started publishing, and it was an effort to connect lesbian cartoonists with each other um, and to help each other share tips, right, but also find publication spaces. And publication spaces, not just, uh, you know, in independent series, but also in zines, which is sort of an emerging space for comics being published in the 90s. And all of these spaces that, as you're saying, are sort of in danger of being lost, right, that you sort of recover um, in your work. Right? Can, can I, like, I mean, because this is so new to an academic forum, um, I, I mean, it, it is... <laughs> It's funny because I, I, I think if you're a sculptor, right, or a painter, you expect that if you are successful, you will have people who are not sculptors and painters um, uh, reviewing your work, critiquing your work, um, archiving your work. Um, this is very new for cartoonists, especially for queer cartoonists. So we're, we're sort of, I think there's a sort of like, huh? Like, wh why do you care? Like, what's going on? You know, um, that still happens with cartoonists. Like, you, you're taking this work seriously. Um, I'm wondering if, like, I mean, you're such a like um, uh, powerful voice now in this new emerging field around the study of this material. It, do you get pushback from from the academic world and, and for the work you want to do? Um, I yes, well, no. In some ways, I was very lucky to get a job where um, I'm hired to teach comics. Um, University of Florida um, is. Uh, the first, I think, institution that had like a comics focus um, when Don Alt, um, who did work on Donald Duck, um, came to UF many, many, many moons ago. Um, and so I sort of was hired to sort of um, take that take that torch and continue running with it. But I did like when I was getting my doctorate, um, you know, there was someone who was like, well, I hope you don't just study comics. Like there's no job in that. Um, you know, and I, I did get pushed back um, in some ways, not from people I worked with, right? Because I chose not to work with those people, um, but from some other folks. Um, and in fact, you know, I thought about, well, like, how can I make folks take comics seriously? Like, so I was thinking about like, well, okay, we need to go to the archives, right? People take the archives seriously. And the archives then showed us that there's all this other work that hasn't been um, focused on, but I was thinking of it also from like a feminist and a queer perspective and folks, if they don't take comics seriously in the academy, they take uh, feminist studies and queer theory seriously. So I was thinking about like what lenses or ways could we look at comics? Um, and I had a really amazing advisor, uh, Nancy K. Miller, um, who has herself written on comics, uh, well, one, one of the first essays on Mouse back in the 90s, um, who, uh, Tanir Oxman, who's written a, a, a wonderful monograph on Jewish women, uh, cartoonists, uh, worked with her. Um, and so uh, she was very supportive of people doing work on comics. I also um, had the privilege of working with uh, Jonathan Gray, uh, Jonathan W. Gray, who does amazing work on uh, race in comics, um, and comics, and Hillary Chute, uh, women, graphic women, uh, Ramsey Fawaz, who does, you know, queer. So I, you know, I sort of try to, you know, you build your community, right? Like you've been talking about getting to know all these cartoonists, which has also been important for my work, right? Personally connecting with these cartoonists who've been so marginalized and making sure that I'm doing the work justice, right? But also connecting with other academics. Uh, who are doing this work and, and building a community of, of support. And there's and so many other people that I could name too. I was just sort of naming some of the people who have been mentors, but I'm sure I'm forgetting people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that, but that's wonderful that there's a sort of emerging community around the study of this work as well. Um, I, um, I've taken over as the interim chair for the MFA in comics program at California College of the Arts, um, which is daunting, um, but I'm excited. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, 
you know, this, you know, it's still so new that we have academic programs around making comics as well as studying them. Um, but I definitely want to make sure that my students come out, that our students come out with a, a knowledge of history. And I, I teach the history of comics um, as they come into the program. Um, and, you know, one of it, it, it's sort of an interesting thing because the, the canon around this art form has not been fully uh, developed in the way or and fought over in the way that um, the canons of uh, other uh, forms um, have. So, so there's still a lot of wiggle room and I can come in and make sure that, you know, people know that Rupert Kennard created the first, you know, queer black characters in comics. And that's important actually. And we should pay attention to that. Uh, whoever, you know, wh whatever we're going to, you know, look to do in comics field, we need to know these, these sort of guideposts, you know, the people who really broke open doors um, that are important for everybody. Um, so it's, it's, it's an exciting moment to be studying comics. And I think in some ways, I mean, um, that with, in terms of like queer comics canon, I mean, like No Straight Lines is doing that work of sort of saying, look, look at these folks, like, as you said, look at Rupert Kennard's work, um, and also the, the documentary, which does that work too. But also, in some ways, it's been uh, you know, uh, at least from an academic perspective, folks started taking notice at Fun Home, at Alison Bechtel's Fun Home. And then it was like, oh, and there's all these other things around this. But then also for me, one of the things I've been sort of uh, interested in is, in is, is, is the looking back, right? Because um, there's a lot of also a lot of energy and attention to uh, what's coming out now and all that work is much more accessible. But all of this earlier work, um, aside from No Straight Lines, is, is much less accessible. So I find myself needing to go on eBay or, you know, go to archives or libraries. And so I've been, you know, I know a lot of us have been thinking about in the documentary is, you know, how do we continue to make this earlier work more accessible? Mm -hmm. um, so do you want to talk about the documentary? Sure. Uh, it's been winning a lot of awards. I mean, it's like almost everyone knows. It. I'm sure everyone's like, if they haven't seen it, go see it. Um, it's amazing. I got a chance to see it at Tribeca in person in it uh, outside the summer. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about that process? Yeah, yeah sure. I'm so glad you were there for for that that uh, first screening. That was the premiere screening at Tribeca, which was uh, an incredible shock to all of us on the film that we got. I mean, it's such an honor to be to be able to premiere at Tribeca. It was really the best possible situation. And in their movie plus category, so we were able to do it in person and with a, um, uh, an in-person panel as well. So we had Allison and Rupert and um, Jen there on the panel as well. Um, so uh, the the movie started, I, I was working on the book, and but I was also teaching a class in queer comics. And I had been bringing um, different cr uh, creators into class and having my students, we would all interview, the students would interview these queer creators and we would film those, those interviews. And I was putting them up on Tumblr at the time. And I was, I asked a friend of mine who was sort of tangentially uh, really uh, involved in, in film um, uh, and, and this guy, Dan Zeitman about it. And he, he suggested to me, well, why don't, I mean, let's make a, a documentary film about, uh, about what you're doing about queer comics and especially with a book coming out. So um, I was like, sure, that doesn't sound hard at all. <laughs> no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, so Dan and I sort of flailed away at a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, that, that footage just wasn't usable. But, um, but then um, our friend uh, Greg Sirota came onto the project and he's, uh, he's an editor, a professional editor. And um, Dan pulled back. Greg and I worked for a couple more years on it and uh, did all the preliminary shooting for, um, for the film, a lot of which is still in the film. And um, uh, with the, the creators like Allison and, and Howard and um, uh, Jen and Mary, and Mary Wings who created the first lesbian comic book. So um, uh, we did that work and then we created a trailer and then Greg had to pull back and uh, Vivian Kleiman, his friend came on and Vivian's a real, you know, a real deal professional filmmaker, uh, Emmy award winner. And she came in, um, I think she was really sold. I told her to go to the first Queers and Comics conference um, in New York in 2015. Uh, and uh, she walked in there and kind of saw the, this extraordinary artistic community and how diverse it was and fascinating and uh, dynamic and she was really sold. So she came in with her own vision about uh, about the film and we worked for the next six years on it. Um, and it was tough, you know, like film, I'm used to comics, which is a really DIY art form, right? It's, you, you can make great comics with a, if you need to, with a ballpoint pen and a, you know, piece of typing paper and a photocopy machine. 
Um, you can't do that with film, <laughs> apparently, I found out. So, you know, you get some creative momentum going, we would film some scenes, some interviews, and then have to stop and fundraise all over again. It was grueling. Uh, we didn't, uh, there were times when we just didn't know whether we'd make it out of the woods, but, um, you know, we worked with some great, you know, uh, fantastic editors and um, uh, cinematographer and sound people and, um, and we got, we got it done and, and Vivian's, you know, uh, uh, brought her vision to this thing and it's, so it's been really, it's been really incredibly validating to see this work now get a lot of attention. We just won the um, Grand Jury Award at, uh, for documentary at Outfest um, and we're sort of in the midst of the um, film festival circuit right now. So it, it's continuing to travel around internationally. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I really appreciated in, in the film is sort of this intergenerational connection. It's not just the history, but it's also sort of brings in uh, contemporary emerging car queer cartoonists and has them sort of reflect on this history and the connection and sort of it's making explicit what's implicit in the book, what became more explicit when um, you mentioned the Queers in Comics uh, conference, which is something that you and Jen Camper uh, uh, like organized together with a lot of other folks in 2015, 2017 and 2019. And one of the things I saw happening there, it sounds like Vivian saw it too, is you know bringing uh, the cartoonists together across the generations, um, having sort of you had panels of just like the historic queer cartoonists, but you also had panels where you're putting folks into conversation with each other. I know you and I were talking recently. I think you said you put a panel where you put Rupert Carnard and Loris Lindell together, yeah. um, two amazing queer black gay men who are doing this really great work. I'm so excited um, so that you like, you know, so it's sort of this very deliberate thing that then is sort of in the film as well. And I, it sounds like Vivian you know, picked up on that and, and, and how you two together put together the arc. Yeah, yeah, Vivian had a great idea of creating a sort of Greek chorus of younger queer cartoonists who could comment upon the work of the older pioneers and about the doors that they opened and the sort of legacy of that. And so we filmed some people at uh, the Queers and Comics Conference and then we went back and actually did another round of filming um, really very late in the game. It was, we were already into post-production and, um, but it was, it was a smart move on Vivian's part. And I, I brought in a bunch of my former students basically. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a shell game because, um, so we filmed, you know, for example, the example you're talking about is we filmed with uh, Lawrence Lindell, uh, who's this, you know, a phenomenal um, uh, younger uh, black um, bisexual cartoonist um, and who was one of my students. And I had taught him about uh, Rupert Kennard's work and, um, um, and so he knew about uh, Rupert and then uh, Jennifer and I put him on a panel with Rupert um, uh, about queer black uh, comics uh, at one of the Queers and Comics conferences, I think in 2017. And so they got to meet, you know, and that was really one of the, the main driving uh, factors for both Jen and myself was to, to put, as you said, kind of generations in contact with each other, right? So that the, the older generation knew that their work meant something. Right, that that their work had value, that it broke open doors that people were had been walking through, and were able to use to utilize in their own careers. And then the younger cartoonists were able to tell the older cartoonists, like, "Thank you." <laughs> you know, it, it's I'm sort of getting for clamped even thinking about it. It's a really powerful um, uh, emotional and spiritual sort of um, connection to be able to to um, for you know, and this is true with me as well. I, I'm, you know, uh, so much of this film and so much of the work that I did with the book and even the, and the museum show was about paying homage to the people who, the pioneers who came before me and were able to, you know, help uh, open doors that I was able to walk through. And then hopefully we can continue passing that along, right? You kind of pass it to the next generation. Um, so, so then, you know, we were able to then film Lawrence talking about how profound it was for him to meet uh, Rupert. Um, and that was such a wonderful sort of, circle, you know, of like um, being able to make those connections between between people that were profound. Yeah, that's great. It looks like, I, I'm not sure if we're at the Q&A yet um, in terms of time, but I also wanted to, I love the work that you've been doing recently um, yeah. with uh, like these posters you've been doing. Um, uh, you know, you're, you've been recovering queer cartoonists and now you're recovering queer history in comics form. So putting those keywords together in a different way. And you did these huge um, posters um, that were appearing in bus kiosks along Market Street. They're also uh, 
digitized online. Um, can you talk about this? I know there's the, yeah. you cover the um, Compton cafeteria riots, which is an early moment of trans revolt uh, prior to the Stonewall riots that most people know about, um, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, queer folks saying like, uh, just putting their foot down and saying we're here. Um, can you talk about that project and where it's going? It was, it, it was a really wonderful project that meant a lot to me. So I, I was commissioned by the San Francisco Arts Commission to create this, year, this series of uh, public art posters, comics posters for, uh, um, along Market Street in the, in the bus kiosks along Market Street, which is the city's major thoroughfare, and um, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of San Francisco Pride. And so I was interested in, well, how do we get to Pride? What was, what was the, the, because so much of pre-Stonewall history and pre-Pride um, March history um, gets lost. Or, you know, people sort of think that queer rights, you know, movement began with Stonewall and that was kind of sort of magically appeared for, you know, um, and that's just not true. And in particular, San Francisco, um, uh, and leading up to that moment in 69 with the Stonewall riots, that, that period of 1955 up through 1970 was particularly profound in San Francisco. We, we fought a lot of the fights that would happen later. We, we um, you know, dealt with a lot of the, um, the concerns that, that would be so um, important and prominent sort of globally um, um, later. So I really wanted to focus on that stuff. So uh, there were six different moments I picked. Um, each one I colored monochromatically um, uh, to, uh, to uh, correlate to one of the colors of the rainbow flags. And um, the six moments I had, you know, the, the founding of the Daughters of Belitis, which was the first lesbian uh, civil rights uh, organization in the United States in 1955. In 1961, Jose Saria ran, who's the drag queen um, impresario of the Black Cat Bar, ran for political office for the first time, a queer, an openly queer person ran for political office in the United States. Um, and then the Compton's Cafeteria Riots, which was, this major um, uh, this riot where trans women, drag queens, and gender nonconforming people fought back against the police and oppression and um, broke a lot of, you know, broke some cop cars and broke a lot of windows and, uh, and revolted. And it was, it, this presaged uh, um, Stonewall, and it was three years before Stonewall. Um, and then another, the Council of Religion and, Higher, and, and the Homosexual, which had done a ball in San Francisco that was raided by the cops and there was resistance and, and fighting back against that. It was the first time the ACLU had taken on a queer case and that the press started turning against the police and actually supporting queer people. Um, so, and then the first pride itself. So I'm really fascinated by these moments. And right now I'm turning this into a book, uh, into a full graphic novel. And what I'm gonna be doing is um, taking each one of these moments, turning them into full chapters uh, with the help of illustrators whose identities more closely align with the subject matters of those chapters. Um, and then I'll be making, and I'll, so I'll be writing the book and I'll be illustrating also these um, uh, memoir sections about my own life in San Francisco that will sort of, you know, intersect or be interstitial uh, chapters in between these different moments. So the idea is to you know, again, I'm sort of fascinated by this, how history affects us um, now and how uh, the legacies of history, whether we're conscious of them or not, affect how we live our lives and produce our work. And so I want to have, the, you know, it'll be a sort of dialogue between these historical moments and then my modern life as a, as a queer person in San Francisco. Um, so that's the graphic novel I'm, um, I'm working on and uh, it'll probably take about two years and, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully be out shortly, shortly there thereafter. That sounds amazing. I'm really excited for that. Um, really, you know, excited to also hear that you're gonna, it's gonna be another collaborative um, project where you're working with um, other artists. I think um, that's often for me, one of the things I love about uh, queer comics is there's often so many moments of uh, collaboration and community and um, holding other cartoonists up. Um, you know, you see it, uh, as you said, at, uh, at the PRISM table in 2003, folks sort of um, coming together. Uh, I've seen it where, you know, uh, cartoonists will table, share tables together, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you see it on the page too. So that's exciting to hear. Um, I don't know, uh, do we have any question? Are we at the question moment or? Uh, how are we doing on time? <laughs> We're doing great on time. Uh, thank you for checking. Um, 
we hadn't really saved a time for questions in case questions did come up, but I did have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was, um, do you think there'll be another, like a no straight lines to highlight other artists or to like have a focus on current artists? Um, and I guess I'm kind of thinking of the project that Rob Kirby had done with queer and 33 cartoonists, which I believe you were also part of. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, where do you think this is going to go for No Straight Lines and um, archiving queer comics? Yeah, I, it's uh, thank you for bringing up uh, Rob's work. I mean, he's he's been a phenomenal community builder and cartoonist throughout all of this. Um, and he created Queer, which you know, with three and three and as the the E's and the queer, um, as a really uh, as sort of a, imagining it in some and positioning it in some ways as a as a sort of sequel to No Straight Lines because it was. Um, bringing in these 33 different artists who were sort of continuing the legacy of, of queer comics into the future, sort of looking to the future, whereas No Straight Lines have been looking to the past. And I, I wrote the intro to that. That was really fun to collaborate with, with Rob on that um, and do work for it as well. Um, I, you know, I don't know what happens next. I, I don't know if I'll do another sort of No Straight Lines project of, in some other, you know, form. Or, um, um, I also feel like the the world of queer comics has it's exploded out laterally so and it's been so profound i mean again you know jennifer and i were jen camper and i were, ta were talking about this recently how we all sort of knew each other you know like <laughs> you know, queer comics was a small enough world where we we felt like we all knew each other actually the reality is once we started digging you know once i started digging into this history you start seeing these tributaries that kind of go off in all these different directions and that, that it actually becomes much deeper and sort of more profound than you expect but in general, you sort of feel like you know the other working queer cartoonists and we were sort of part of this community that was in contact with each other. Um, and now, you know, a, a, there's a, be a queer graphic novel that shows up on the shelves that I've never heard of. I didn't know it was, I didn't know it was happening. And that's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, it, it's, it's good. It's, um, I, I, but I also maybe feel like the next set of archiving of, of the sort of newer work needs to be done by an, another generation of, of cartoonists that that you know understand web comics better than I do and have their pulse you know figure on the pulse in ways that I don't anymore. Um, but I'm still interested in um, in archiving the work of the of the previous generations. I, I think the next real project would be um, to uh, get a, a comprehensive archive of a lot of these original pages and uh, publications um, at, at a place like the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco or the Schluter's Museum in Berlin or at Columbia University or Ohio State, uh, Billy Ireland's library or something like that, right? Um, to, to find a place for a queer comics collection. Um, so I think that would be the next, um, it, it, that would be the next project really that would make sense in terms of this, this lineage. And if I can add to that too, I think um, I'm thinking there's, there's, you know, as we've been talking about explosion of queer comics recently, but also of anthologies. And one of the ones um, that I have really appreciated is, is We're Still Here, which yeah. was a all trans comics anthology um, that was uh, funded through Kickstarter. I mean, that's the thing too, is a lot of these projects now are coming through Kickstarter. They're coming through other sources. So I, I also am curious about their longevity in terms of will they be available um, in 20 years from now um, uh, on, on the shelf? So I think, you know, uh, just in that project sounds um, amazing in terms of getting a queer comics collection somewhere. I've been thinking on my own about building an index, right, to some of this wow. earlier stuff, like where these things are appearing in grassroots newspapers, but I also uh, have a book proposal that I need to finish uh, for a collection of um, hopefully uh, showing some more of this uh, material from the early 90s, some of the lesbian, there's a huge lesbian cartoonist boom um, in the early 90s and a lot of really funny uh, things I think would still, uh, you know, they're talking about lesbian culture at that moment, uh, moment and sort of their activism at that moment, but I think it would still sort of uh, be relevant and interesting for, to folks today who are drawing comics, who are involved in social justice and all of, you know, what were those, um, consideration. So I think there's a lot that's being done, but a lot yeah. more that definitely can be done on multiple fronts. So I'm always like at the end, I'm always like call to action. And I'm excited <laughs> that there are people like Justin and that y'all invited us to chat. Yeah. Um, 
the, and, and there's like thinking about like the um it, it, i think it's um uh, uh, important for a number of different reasons one of them is of course the history of comics right like you see comics evolving right as, as a form and these different queer cartoonists who are bringing their queer sensibilities um which are quite different actually at times they come from their own their own histories of of queer expression bringing that to the comics form so we kind of see you know comics evolving but we also it, it also provides this very unique window into queer history and culture, right? Because comics are so DIY and happening on the ground and requiring no resources. So uh, you see queer artists responding to the moment in a way that's far more nimble and honest and uncensored than almost any other form. I would say, I would say almost you know, pretty much any form. Um, and that's really exciting. I think for anyone who's interested in queer history, they should be reading Dykes to Watch Out For, right? They should be reading the mostly unfabulous social life of Ethan Green or Strange Looking Exile. Like they should be reading that material because that provides this incredible window into what was happening. And cartoonists were reacting on in in you know on the ground to the AIDS crisis, to um, you know any number of political moments um, and social moments that were that were evolving for for queer people. Thank you both for sharing that. <laughs> um, I was going to say when um, you talking about like seeing queer works that you hadn't heard about, and then um, and Margaret, you you were talking about uh, Kickstarter. Just made me think that first we were, especially in the queer community, we were all trying to make these works as a way to find each other, and it seems like now we have found each other. We're like unionizing or something and creating these Kickstarter projects together instead of just like, hey, is it, does anyone else feel like me? It's like, hey, does anyone feel like me? But yeah, I already know you, you and you, let's get together and then put this out. Mm -hmm. and, and, but, and it is like what, you know, uh, Margaret, what you, what you mentioned here that, that there is a danger. I mean, it's wonderful how democratized the, this, the, this production has become because of things like crowdsourcing platforms. But it, there is a danger, like, you know, once they burn through, I mean, I just did a, you know, a crowdsourced book and we burn through our print run pretty quickly. And who knows, you know, like, uh, you know, Fanographics is keeping no straight lines in print. It's like in its fourth printing now or something like that. But so there's a little bit more um, uh, security sometimes with, with, with these um, uh, established publishers, not always. Um, but uh, it is something we still need to sort of think about how do we archive the current moment? Um, because the, a lot of these books that we sort of assume are gonna be on our shelves forever, uh, sometimes aren't. And this becomes really hard when you're teaching too. Sometimes I wanna assign, um, yeah. not even just a queer comics, just a comic book and it's yeah. gone out of print. And sometimes it's gone out of print at Fantagraphics. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Amazing King, which is a biography of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was out of print. And so I was like, well, how do I assign this work to teach it? Um, and there are ways to do that, but it, it can be difficult. So, you know, I'm aware of uh, how much, uh, how precarious uh, uh, comics history is uh, now, also now happening now. So it's something um, that we should all be thinking about. It makes me think that um, it's what we say about any kind of progress that's made. Um, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna bring us to a close. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much, Justin and Margaret. Um, let me just do that, get this ready. Um, these are the upcoming Cyberfest uh, rebooted events we have. Today, we still have the screen printing with paper stencils uh, with Yael, that's from three to four. And then tomorrow we have another round of show and tell with 10 exhibitors drawing prompts with Lauren Davis and teaching drawing elements of comics to kids workshop with Maggie Ram. Um, and of course, this is just the first weekend. We still have the weekdays. <laughs> so we have an event every weeknight and then the following weekend as well. You can check out the full schedule on sfzinefest.org. I wanted to thank our Bay Area ASL interpreters, Nicole Watson and Norma Sanchez, who are interpreting now. Thank you. And also remind everyone that SF Zine Fest is a member of Intersection for the Arts. Intersection for the Arts is a bedrock Bay Area arts nonprofit that provides people working in arts and culture with fiscal sponsorship and resources to grow.
I'm going to stop us there. And that's Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <Will. laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. 